Destiny that you'll go back and listen. I think it'll be helpful to you. Does everybody have a note sheet this morning that wants one? If not, raise your hand and Pastor Hunter will get one to you. Anybody else need one? All right, it is our custom in this church to stand in honor of the reading of God. And so I had planned to read Matthew 7, 15 through 27, but I'm actually going to stop at verse 20 today because I think you might want to eat lunch some at a reasonable time. So <laughs> come on. All right, Matthew 7, beginning in verse 15. Jesus says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. So in our text, we come to what is the last section on the most famous sermon ever preached, namely the Sermon on the Mount which is about the good news of the kingdom. That's the summary of all that Jesus preaches. That's made clear in Matthew chapter 4. So in the preceding text, Jesus describes, we talked about this last week, two paths of life. He talks about the wide path that most people take. It's the comfortable path. It's the path of the world, the secular world. And... He contrasts that with the narrow path, the path of the kingdom. He says, last, as we saw last week, that it is a narrow and it is a difficult way. A few years back, we had uh, the great privilege, I had the great privilege of traveling to Colorado, where I lived for six years with a large group of people from this church because one of our former associate pastors who actually moved here with me got married and followed the lady back to Colorado. I'm still a little bit bitter about it, but I'll get over it. So when he got married, uh, several of us who were close to him went to Colorado and we went several days early because many of the people that went had not formerly been there, and they wanted to do a little sightseeing. And before they left, one of the, the big to-dos, one of the, the main attractions they wanted to see, understandably, was the majestic Rocky Mountains. How many have ever been to Rocky Mountain National Park? It's a beautiful place. And so I, I was supportive of going. I thought, man, if you go to Colorado, you need to go to the mountains. There was one problem. It was January. If you know anything about Colorado, you might know that it snows quite a bit, particularly in the mountains. And it doesn't just snow. It snows a lot. But they were determined. And so we went. And we had to take a, a couple, either two, maybe even three vehicles. I can't remember. But before we left, uh, I was staying with a friend of mine there in Colorado, and I was, Nikki and I were riding uh, with him, and we were about to leave, and there was another car behind us, and so Britton gave a little bit of instruction of, about what to expect when driving up the mountain in January. And he talked about the curvy roads and the icy conditions and how to handle that, and so after the, the kind of talk there, we made our way up. And I'll never forget it. Like my stomach was tense the whole time because the vehicle I was in was fine. But we were constantly looking back, worried about those who had never driven up the mountain in those conditions. And it was not easy. It was not fun. But once we made it to the top and we saw the beauty of the mountains, like we breathed easy, and we enjoyed ourselves trekking through the deep snow in frigid conditions. 
It was fun until we realized afterwards we had to go back down, which is a bit more precarious. Like going up a mountain in the icy conditions is much easier than going back down, right? So that was a fun experience. We made it safely home. But, you know, after the invitation that Jesus gives to all of us to join him on this narrow path, the path of the kingdom, in our text today, here's what he does. He challenges his people to be careful, to be watchful. Because here's what he says, there are some dangers along the way. And I would categorize the dangers in two ways. Number one, he warns against uh, false prophets, or I I would like to say false preachers. And then he talks about false disciples, those who claim to be followers of God and actually do not know God. So I intended to preach both of those on both of those topics this morning, but again, uh, it the first part of this came out to be so uh, in-depth that I thought, you know what, I better just stop there, and I'll, God willing, we'll handle the next text next week. So today, we're going to talk about the hazard of false teachers. I can't think of many things more relevant to preach on in this day and age. So in verse 15, here's what Jesus says. Beware. Strong word, isn't it? Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. So I use the word false preachers, or you could say false teachers, rather than false prophets, because in 2 Peter 2, 1, you can look this up later, Peter equates the false prophets of the Old Testament with the false teachers, false preachers of the New Testament who are introducing heresy amongst the community of believers. Now, Jesus likely uses the word prophet in Matthew 7 because he's talking to Jews who are still essentially under the Old Covenant. And that's the office that they were familiar with, the office of prophet. But again, Peter makes the connection for the New Testament church and says, watch out, beware of false teachers. They are just like the false prophets of the Old Testament who seek to lead the children of Israel astray. So let's talk quickly about the history of these false teachers, false prophets. The threat of false prophets amongst God's people is nothing new, is it? As a matter of fact, you can go to the very first pages of your Bible And you can see the Word of God twisted and the people of God led astray. So if you would take your Bible and go with me to chapter 2 of the book of Genesis. I'll give you just a moment to turn there. Or to scroll there. Genesis 2, and let's go down to verse 16. The Lord God commanded the man, Adam, saying... You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. And here's what he says. Here's why. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. But then what happens? Let's flip over another page. The serpent comes along. And what's he do? He twists God's words and God's intent. And he says, hey, maybe that's not what God really meant. So Genesis 3, 4 through 6, the serpent said to the woman, she's kind of glaring at that beautiful fruit of the tree, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. You'll be like him, knowing good and evil. So the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was a delight for the eyes, to the eyes. And that tree was to be desired to make one wise. And she took of its fruit and she ate. And also gave some to her husband who was with her. And he ate. It's from the very beginning of the Bible. God's word has been twisted. False teachings have been present since page two of your Bible. 
Well, it didn't get any better throughout the rest of the Bible. Remember, God made for himself, he called for himself an old people, uh, 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 people for himself, excuse me, in the Old Testament. He called them through the family of Abraham, remember this, and he promised blessing upon them. I will be your God, you'll be my people. He told them that as Moses brought the people out of Egypt, Moses gave the people the law. And there was a threat then of false prophets. Let me just give you one example. Jeremiah 14, 14, I'll read this for you. And the Lord said to me, the prophet, the prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I did not send them. Nor did I command them to speak. They are prophesying to you a lying vision, worthless divination, and the deceit of their own minds. So not every prophecy you hear, no matter how spiritual it sounds, is from the Lord. So we need to remember the point here is that the enemy has always used false teachings to move people away from God, astray. Why would it be any different now? These false teachers are a, hear me, they are a clear and they are a present danger to the church. So we've looked at the history of false teachers. Let's consider their disguise, the disguise of false teachers. So going back to that first verse, Jesus says, Beware of false prophets who come to you, listen to this, in sheep's clothing, but inwardly, they are ravenous wolves. In other words, they're, not a, they're, they're dressed differently, right? They appear to be something that they are not. And Jesus warns us that they often look like sheep. And you know probably that sheep is a common metaphor in the Bible for the people of God. We are sheep. Christ is the shepherd. Amen? Sometimes false teachers are very obvious, right? Like, they believe that everyone will be saved. That's what they preach, that no matter what people believe or how they live, that they're okay and everybody goes to heaven. They deny the Trinity. They deny the substitutionary work of Jesus. But the warning here seems to be from Jesus about those false teachers who erroneously teach messages that are much more subtle. Something that you might not catch first off. He seems to be warning his audience that people like the Pharisees, who he's talked much about, the religious elites of the day who seem super spiritual, actually have hearts far from God. They're not who they seem to be. I'll read to you a, a story given by Pastor Chuck Swindoll. It's fascinating. He tells the story of a friend who once ate dog food. Interestingly, the man was not starving, nor was he part of some fraternity initiation. Instead, it happened at a dinner party, get this, hosted by one of his friends who just happened to be a well-to-do physician. His wife had just graduated some gourmet cooking class and wanted to put her culinary skills to the test. So here's what she did. She served the dog food secretly on thin crackers, she prepared them secretly, on thin crackers with a wedge of imported cheese, bacon bits, an olive topped with a little bit of pimento. Swindoll's friend could not get enough of the delicacy. The woman, thrilled with her culinary skills, grinned as she watched the crackers disappear very quickly by all the guests. They all had a good laugh at the end. They were good sports as she revealed what they had been eating. But, you know, I think it's a perfect illustration for one of the hazards of which Jesus warns us, namely spiritual deception. You know, we can be fooled into thinking we're eating the meat of God's word while, in fact, we're being fed dog food, as it were, right? And it will lead us away, if we're not careful, from the path that God has us on. False teachers go out of their way to blend in with the rest of us. They know the Christian language. They know the big words of Christianity, right? They know how to act Christian. They carry their Bibles everywhere they go, but they are not what they seem. 
As a matter of fact, Jesus uses a strong illustration when he describes these people. He said they're dressed as sheep, but they're actually, get this, ravenous wolves. Ravenous wolves. That's a strong image. Which means this. These false teachers are the spirit behind them. The goal is not just to mess with you. It's to devour you. Does that sound familiar? It should. First Peter 5, 8. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. Watch this. Seeking someone to mess with, to devour. How does the enemy devour you? Well, perhaps in many different ways, but one made... One way made clear in Jesus' message is by false teaching. Let me just clarify what I mean by false preachers, false teachers. No preacher is perfect or infallible. I certainly do not claim to be. But faithful pastors will look hard to get to the heart of what, sh- what each passage really means. Not just what it says, but God's intended meaning for each pastor. Christy shared just a minute ago, one of our values is expository preaching here, which literally means to expose. The goal when I come to a text is not to read in my doctrines to the test or to come up with catchy phrases. It's to ask the question and to answer the question, what is God saying in this text? So false teachers are those who consciously or sometimes, sadly, unconsciously are used by the enemy to lead God's people astray. And those are people, friends, we've got to avoid at all costs. Not asking you to be cynical. We have enough cynicism today, don't we? But I am asking you to watch out for warning signs because these men and women can look like one of us. Let me ask you this. Have you ever been to Walmart and gone up to somebody wearing a blue shirt and khakis and ask them about a product, something about the store, where something is, and they go, I don't work here. And you're like, really? Right? Don't assume just because preachers look like sheep, they can quote a bunch of scripture that they're actually, that they actually are sheep. So, What are some warning signs of false teachers? Number one, and please listen to this whole point before you judge me, okay? One of the warning signs is a miracle-driven ministry. We don't have to get out of Matthew chapter 7 to see this. One of the warning signs about false teachers is this hyper-focus on miracles, especially the ones that they perform. Jesus actually warns The Bible warns about such people. Again, we don't even have to get out of Matthew chapter 7. Look at verse 22 to 23. I'll look at this next week in depth. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, listen to this. Did we not prophesy in your name? A prophet. And cast out demons in your name. That sounds like a spiritual person. And do many mighty works in your name. And here's what Jesus will declare to them. I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Sobering words. Not everyone who does quote unquote mighty works in the name of Jesus even. Is even saved. The sad part here is that some people even fool themselves, which seems to be the case in Matthew 7, 22. It's like this. It's like, I can do miracles in Jesus' name, so I must be all right. Don't be so sure. Jesus, in talking about the last days, gives us some compelling words in the next book of the Bible, in the book of Mark. It's recorded, Matthew, or excuse me, Mark 13, verse 22. Listen to this, for false Christs and false prophets will arise, and listen to what they do. They'll perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. Hear me, beloved. I have heard many people ignore blatant 
false teachings because the man or woman of God is quote unquote anointed. Oh, they must be all right, man. They're anointed. And what they mean is they do lots of cool things at the altar. Friend, the supernatural does not serve as the litmus test, the litmus test for spirituality. I'm sorry, it just doesn't. Now, let me clarify. I believe that God still works miracles. Do you hear me? I believe in the gifts of the Spirit. Paul says, actually, don't forbid them. But when one man or woman is seen as a quote unquote miracle worker, and a church is hyper focused on miracles rather than God's word and making much of Christ, this can be a clever cover up for false teaching that is meant to lead God's people astray. And I bought it for many years, just to be quite honest. What's the second warning sign? It is this. It's the twisting of Scripture. Have you ever heard me talk about this? So in 2 Timothy chapter 4, Timothy is Paul's apprentice. Paul instructs him to preach the word. We quote that verse a lot. But before he admonishes Timothy to do this thing, to preach God's word faithfully, here's another command that he gives him. This is 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed. Listen, rightly handling the word of truth. Friends, it is not enough to preach God's word. We must do it faithfully and honestly and according to context. We must reveal what the text really means. Who's with me? Just because a preacher uses scripture does not mean he's telling you the truth. About 15 or 20 years ago, I started visiting some hyper charismatic churches. I began watching a lot of Christian television, particularly TBN, which was full of pompous preachers. You ever seen them? I purchased the tapes of preachers like Kenneth Copeland. And I I couldn't get enough. I listened to them religiously. I had a little truck with a cassette player. Come on, somebody. And, man, I would wear those things out. Like tapes, they seem to lose quality the more that you listen to them, right? Some of you young people are like, what is a tape, right? (laughs) But these preachers were teaching a totally different message than what I had been taught by faithful pastors growing up. But the message that they were preaching was actually music to my ears because I was in a very rebellious state of life. I wanted the world. So their their message was appealing to me because it suggested that I could have Jesus and at the same time fulfill all my wildest dreams. As a matter of fact, Jesus was the means of getting rich and having bigger houses and getting everything your little heart desires. 2 Timothy 4, 3. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. And here it is. But have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers. Watch this. To suit their own passions. We ignore the false doctrine because we want what they're selling. We want the comfortable life where we don't go through any suffering. We want to be rich in this life beyond our wildest dreams. And I'm not against money. God blesses some people in that way so that they can give to many other people. But the Bible says, do not desire to be rich. While this is the message that they're preaching contrary to God's word. So when my pastors and family members would warn me against such teaching, they got, Chris, you've lost your mind. Here was my reply. They're telling the truth. It's in the Bible. They use scriptures and use scriptures they did. They use the Bible to back up everything they've said. But a few years later, I learned this little helpful principle called context. As I studied the word more intently, the the veil was lifted, and I realized that I had been duped, and friends, it almost killed me. 
That's why I'm a little bitter about it today, because not only did it hurt me, but I was young in ministry and really untrained, and I fed this garbage to a youth group of kids. Just repeating what I heard, because I trusted the people on TV and Any pastor in this area was telling the truth because they used the Bible, and it's just not the case. God forgive me for ever teaching that garbage. I've got to be careful. Just because someone's using the Bible doesn't mean they're telling you the truth. Look at the context. Another sign of false teachers is the bearing of bad fruit. The word fruit or fruits is used seven times in these six verses. It means we should probably pay close attention. The false teacher, or the, excuse me, the teacher that bears good fruit will result, it will be, excuse me, the truth. Uh, a, a preacher that is preaching the truth, let me get this right, will bear good fruit, meaning That the values and the ethics that Jesus has just preached in this Sermon on the Mount. It'll line up with his life. It'll match those values. One example of bad fruit is where, again, there's this hyper focus on money and possessions. Let me give you another example. The values of the kingdom of God that we have been looking at over the past several weeks can be summed up in this. Love God with all of your heart and radically love people. The Pharisees claimed to love God, remember this? But they did not have hearts for people. Actually, they claimed to love God, but they didn't really love God. And they did not love other people. They used other people to bolster their own egos and their own spirituality. Jesus revealed this. I know a pastor, I won't call his name out, but of a prominent church in another state who literally, along with his wife, hates, hates people. I can't tell you how much he hates people. He hates his staff. He hates anyone who would ever dare challenge him. His tagline is this, ministry would be great if it weren't for the people. Now, I've heard other pastors joke about that. I've probably said that in joking, but he means it. He means it. So I've had people ask me, why would people stay at this church? And let me tell you why. Because he is an eloquent and dynamic preacher. And it's like that makes everything else okay. It's like on Sunday morning, I want to be entertained, so I'm just going to ignore all these other Red flags. Let's consider the fruit of the Spirit as we're talking about fruit. Galatians 5, 22 and 23, familiar passage. The fruit of the Spirit is this, love. Number one, love and every other fruit flows out from this. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Now, I'm not claiming that a faithful pastor demonstrates the fruit of the Spirit always. I certainly don't, and I hate that. But this fruit should generally describe the character of a preacher. God, help us. And this is the fruit that should be produced normally in those who sit under a pastor's teaching. So a warning sign is the bearing of bad fruit. Number four... Another warning sign would be the loosening of God's law. Listen to me. A teacher who encourages what the Bible clearly forbids is to be avoided at all costs. Let me read you another familiar text from the Old Testament, Isaiah 5.20. Woe to you who call evil good and good evil. Is that not where, where we're at as a nation? Who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Had a friend who I'm convinced really loved God and had a heart to follow him. And this friend struggled with her sexuality. She was attracted to other women. For many years she fought it. She knew that it was wrong. She got counseling 
And she prayed, God, take this desire from me. Until she met some, quote unquote, good Christian friends outside of the church who told her they loved Jesus, but said, listen, the lifestyle that you're talking about is actually not wrong. The church has got it wrong for the last 2,000 years. Actually, many more because the Old Testament speaks of it too. That's not what it's talking about. Love is love. She believed it after hearing it enough. She started reading books by Christian mystics, whatever that is. And my heart breaks because she believed the lie. And she's living that lifestyle. And here's, what she, here's the most disturbing part. She would say, I'm closer to God than I've ever been. That's just one example. All kinds of sin is propagated in the church. I'm talking about black and white sins. Or in a lot of churches, you hear pastors who will never broach the subject of sin, which is another massive issue. Amen? I, listen, I'm not a fire and brimstone preacher. I don't think I could ever be accused of that. But I'm not scared in love, the balance of grace and truth, to say this is sin. Here's what the Bible says, and this is not. Right and wrong is objective. And pastors ought to faithfully reveal those right and wrongs. Okay? Number five, I'm almost done here. <clears throat> it's actually the other side of the spectrum here of what I just talked about, and it would be the tightening of God's law. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I just preached in depth on this a couple of weeks ago. We've seen over the last several weeks that the Pharisees, the religious elites, and the scribes, they tightened God's law. They didn't loosen it. Well, in some places they loosened it, but a lot of times they tightened it. And particularly when people were coming to Christ they really tighten the law and say, well, you have to still live. If you're a Gentile, a non-Jewish believer, you still have to live by the Old Testament law, which Jesus fulfilled. So all these ceremonies and all these festivals, they had added to the law in the Old Testament all their like extra biblical traditions, and they put those traditions on other people, which caused many people to be spiritually deceived and frustrated their relationships with the Lord. So we've got to be careful, particularly in this area. I'd say this is more of a problem than loosening the law, that we don't, that we don't take traditions from our churches. Many of us grew up in very strict churches, and I'm not against that. I mean, there's, there's some helpful things that are taught. And if you stand by those convictions, great. Nothing wrong with that. I'm not putting that down. But do not put your extra biblical convictions, things that the Bible does not clearly forbid, don't put those on other people. C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity calls that person a certain type of bad man. Okay? Number five, finally, when it comes to false teachers, there's a, the warning sign, the red flag of a self-exalting ministry rather than a Christ-exalting ministry. How often do you see this today? I believe that the office of pastor is one of honor. It should be respected to an extent. But there are circles, I've been part of them, where pastors are treated like kings. It's like they can't even carry their own Bible to the pulpit. Now, I have people who help me, and it's, but it's not because I think I'm better than people. I just forget everything, all right? My wife and some other people in the church, like, no, like, we've got to remember to get Chris's water, which is missing this morning. I'm not bitter about that at all. We've got to make sure he, got it. he has his notes. Hunter asked me right before service, you want me to carry those to the pulpit for you? I'm like, I got it. They have great faith in me. 
But here's the thing. In some of these circles, pastors are almost worshipped. They speak about the Lord, but they speak more about themselves or their particular ministry. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2.2. He says, For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's the message of the church. Listen, faithful preachers will not make much of themselves. They will make much of Jesus. And I hope I faithfully do that. Listen to this. I've got a good friend who is friends with a former worship pastor who used to work for a a prominent church, many of which you're familiar with, and you share clips all the time from this particular church. And I'm not going to call it out because I don't know the heart of this pastor, and this is from a person that I trust, but it's a friend of a friend. But let me just leave this with you. So this worship, former worship pastor said that in a Sunday school class, kids were giving coloring sheets. You know how like in Sunday school you had coloring sheets of Noah's Ark and, you know, Adam and Eve and so on and so forth. They weren't coloring sheets of that. I'm sure they had some of that, but they were coloring sheets of the pastor. I expect that to happen in kids' church next week. <laughs> I shouldn't joke. It's not funny. Um, What's well, kind of funny. But here's what they, they, it was used as a springboard to say how anointed the pastor is. And how you shouldn't touch God's anointed, which is a total, total misrepresentation of the context of that Old Testament scripture. Pastors that want to micromanage and push their way through say, well, don't touch God's anointed. No. I went to a camp meeting in Ohio once, actually twice, when I was in this other movement. My friend and I were standing in a packed hallway, excited people waiting to get in the doors of the sanctuary so we could get a good seat. My friend noticed something. He says, Chris, he said, something's bothering me. And I said, well, what is it? Like, I'm excited. What is it? He says, look around at the hallway. The hallway was lined with picture after picture of the pastor working in ministry, preaching, that exact pose. Almost no Christian symbols that I can remember in the hallways. A faithful preacher will point others beyond himself onto the risen Christ, and I hope I do that faithfully. On Wednesdays, we're going through the book of Revelation. If you haven't been here, you need to come. It's been good. It's interesting that the author of the book, who is, we believe, John the Apostle, does not identify himself as such. He just says, I, John. What he does call himself in the book is Paul does in other letters of himself. He refers to himself as a servant. And can I just tell you, speaking for myself and all other pastors, we are not people to be worshipped. We're not people to be put on a pedestal. We are servants to help you and to be used of the Lord for his good work. In closing, as a pastor in this day and age, can I just tell you that it is a weighty task to protect the flock from false teachers. Years ago, even 20 years ago, all you had to do was worry about somebody coming in the church and spreading heresy. Well, now, what do we have? YouTube, podcast, TBN. blogs, websites. It's available 24-7. And the real problem is a lot of Christians today don't know the truth. They don't know their Bibles. They don't read it for themselves. They don't listen and they, they hear a sermon and they don't go home and meditate on it and look at their hand out and, and, and really think through it. And say, Lord, use this to do something in my life, to bear good fruit. And so they're often duped and led astray. Beloved, I'm not being mean today. I'm just asking you to be careful because I care about you. I'd ask you to have grace upon me. I've had people leave the church because they say, well, he shouldn't be involved in picking out the small group curriculum. Really? Really? 
There's a lot of garbage out there, and I'm responsible for the flock of this church. So if you're not an elder of the church, you can give suggestions, but it's going to go through our eldership to make sure that it aligns with the truth. I get flack because I won't sing certain songs that are out there. But you know what? We remember what we sing. And there's a lot of garbage. And it's not new. I mean, there's some hymns that aren't doctrinally correct. And a lot of songs today, they say nothing. Or they say really heretical things. Or at least false things. And by the way, there's a lot of new good music too. Much of which we sing here. But understand, I'm not being a micromanager when I act in these ways. I'm being a shepherd because I'm going to answer to the Lord one day. And the Bible says that teachers are held to a greater standard. And I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We're grateful for who you are. We're grateful for truth. I pray for this preacher. I pray that, God, you would help me to preach the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. That I would never be pompous, arrogant, prideful, dogmatic about things that I don't need to be dogmatic about. That I would get the balance right between grace and truth. Give us all ears to hear and not be led astray by those people, the many, many people who are on the radio and television, not all of them, ones who have podcasts, who fill social media with their propaganda. Help us to be vigilant, watchful, and not be led astray. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you don't know the Lord this 